Shalom, everyone. It's uh, great to be here in <laughs> icy, cold, cloudy northeast Ohio, but that's just the way it is. Sun shining somewhere, but uh, there are a few of us, about a dozen gathered here. And I just want to make an announcement this week that this will probably be the last time I do a live stream from the Ministry Center because uh, most of us who gather here are the tech team members and their families and significant others. And we want to start meeting our own home groups in our own homes. So we're going to start pre-recording the teachings, probably on a Thursday night or a Friday morning. And um, then I will send out a link to you, watch your emails. And then the benefit to you is this. If your home fellowship is meeting on a Friday night, and having an air of Shabbat, you can watch it then, and you can discuss it after your meal. You can watch it in the morning, the afternoon. You can have Havdalah together Saturday evening, and uh, then have something to eat, and then sit back and watch the teaching that time. So it gives you a lot more flexibility through the Sabbath, and uh, it gives us a chance to, uh, to enjoy home fellowships as well. And uh, Robin and I are hoping to visit home fellowships around the Beth Decoon area. And so if you would like us to come crash your party some Sabbath, just let us know and we'd love to come along and encourage you and help you and uh, with anything we can and because we won't be stuck here in this building on Sabbath. Okay, so with that, uh, now there is a possibility that next week we will do another live stream. Uh, depends on uh, exactly what happens. We have something special in mind for you. So we'll just have to wait and see next week. But uh, if not this week, next week will be the last live stream Then it'll be pre-recorded after that. All right, well, let's have a word of prayer. We'll get right into our teaching of 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Our Father and our King, thank you so much for accepting us into your presence. And thank you so much for sending your son into ours. And thank you, Father, that you invite us into intimate fellowship with you each day at each moment of the day to walk with you, to share our hearts with you, to hear your voice. So, Father, I pray you would guide us today on this special Sabbath when you, the Lord of the Sabbath, make your home in our homes. Father, I pray you would uh, speak to us through the this unique chapter in the, the apostolic scriptures. It's so unusual, but Lord, it's so appropriate for the days in which we live. So Father, as we study together, as we hear this teaching, whether it's live or pre-recorded, I pray, Father, you'd keep us protected from error, from confusion, from distraction, so we can hear what you would speak through the, the words of your holy apostle, Paul. So, Father, we thank you for the Sabbath day and this unique time in which we gather. We praise you for it in Yeshua's name. Amen. I want to give you a few preliminaries about the, this chapter and the prayer I mentioned, how it's so unique. And there are three things I want you to keep in mind as preliminary matters as we go into chapter 7. Uh, I have to confess that as we approach this chapter, I wasn't really looking forward to it because it's always been one that has been the source of so much confusion about marriage and divorce and this and that. And, and this chapter has been misused um, and caused a lot of confusion. But the more I looked into it, I realized it's not a confusing chapter at all. The times were confusing but Paul's words are not. So there are three things I want us to keep in mind as we look into this chapter. First of all, he's addressing babies in Messiah. This is what he calls them back in chapter 3. These are babies in Messiah. They're new believers. And these are not new Jewish believers who know the Torah. These are new ex-pagan believers who are just beginning to learn the Torah, beginning to learn God's ways, learning what it means to talk, with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to walk with him. And so he's addressing some preliminary matters. They had written to him, 
to Paul, and he's addressing questions. If you look at the first verse, it says, Now concerning the matters about which you wrote. You look over chapter 8, verse 1. It says, Now concerning food offered idols. You go over to chapter 12, verse 1. And it says, now concerning spiritual gifts. So he's answering these topics, and he's commenting on the topics that they had written to him about. And um, these are very basic topics in Paul's mind. But to us, they can seem very sophisticated. But we have to remember that what he's teaching here are to babies and Messiah. We don't want to be babies and Messiah. We want to grow up into maturity. And as we follow Paul's instruction here, we'll also find a good deal of meat here to chew on. The second thing is that this chapter is written during a uniquely difficult time. There was something at hand that was about to happen, and Paul is, he refers to this. And so, so much of what he has to say is because of this unique time that was approaching a uniquely difficult and troublesome time. For example, turn over to verse 26. He says, I think that in view of the present distress, the present distress, we don't know what this present distress was. And down at verse 29, he says, this is what I mean, brothers, the appointed season has grown very short. In other words, we have just a short time before something horrific is going to happen. And they were at the early stages. You know, I think what a timely chapter this is for us living in the United States of America, anywhere in the world for that matter, here in January of 2021. The world has changed in just one month. It's changed in just one year. And I think the changes will grow more rapid and more dire. And um, so the, the instruction that Paul gives us here in chapter 7 is very timely. Now, some people think, oh, well, he's talking about uh, the coming of Messiah. They, you know, they all believed Yeshua was returning. But we tend to think that Paul thought he was going to return just any moment. And the tribulation is going to happen. And it's just going to be this horrible time. That is not what was in view. That is not what Paul's referring to. If you go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, you can just write down the references if you want. But if you turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the chapter starts this way. Now concerning the coming of our master, King Yeshua, and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the master has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first, the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? So here Paul is saying, no, it's not quite time yet. There's a bunch of things that have to happen before Yeshua comes back. So it wasn't the return of Yeshua he was looking at. There are a couple possibilities. We know that in 51 AD, there was a terrible famine that hit this part of the world. And whenever there's a famine, there's a lot of social upheaval. There are a lot of difficulties and often persecution comes. So this could be the thing that Paul saw around the corner. And so he's telling his people and the people in Corinth, batten down the hatches, tough times are coming. It's not going to be business as usual for a while. So whatever this difficult time was, maybe it was like the days we live in now. Maybe it's just a time of great persecution that he saw coming. We don't know. He doesn't tell us, but it's a template for our day as well. And then the third thing is they needed to learn how to adjust to a changing situation. You know, we always want to go back to business as usual. We want to go back to how things were. That's normal. That's healthy. I get it. We all want that. There's comfort and security in tradition and in sameness. So things are predictable. 
But in every generation, in my parents' generation, in uh, my generation, and again in this new generation, times come when it is not business as usual. And to resist the changes that come just makes life much more difficult for ourselves. And this uncertainty is reflected uh, in this chapter in this way. I want you to notice something. This is the only chapter in the entire New Testament scriptures where the author is always going back and forth between this is what I'm saying and then this is what God's saying. I want you to mark these verses. Uh, in the Thursday update, I asked you to look for these. So let's see if you found them. There are six of them. Verse 6, Paul says, Now as a suggestion, not a command, I say this. Okay, in other words, this didn't come from the Lord. This is me talking out of my experience and wisdom. Verse 10, to the married I give this charge, not I, but the master. In other words, this isn't my opinion. This is what Yeshua is saying. Verse 12, to the rest I say, I, not the master. This is my opinion. This is my advice. This isn't the Lord's, but this is coming from my wisdom and my experience. Verse 17, he, uh, the first part of the verse, but you go to the second half of the verse, says, this is my rule in all the assemblies. I've set up a, a rule, a halakha, uh, uh, a way to do things. This is something I have established. And then you go on over to verse 25. Now concerning the betrothed, I have no command from the master. But I give my judgment. Okay, this is my opinion, my advice. And, um, and then the last verse of the chapter, verse 40. He says, yet in my judgment, in other words, this isn't the Lord speaking, this is my judgment, my opinion. And he goes on to give his, his opinion. Why is he doing this? Um, the, uh, the Jewish, Messianic Jewish New Testament commentator, David H. Stern, many of you may have his New Testament Jewish commentary, he writes this, in no other chapter of the New Testament is the writer so at pains to state precisely the degree of authority to be attributed to each of his pronouncements. Why is this happening? It's because of this. It's uncertain times. The rules are going to change. And the way we live out the commandments and apply the commandments are going to need a little adjusting. And... Um, we need to learn to think on our feet. We need to learn to adapt. We want to be loyal and faithful to the Torah, but the way we live the Torah out is going to be affected by what we can do, what we're allowed to do, what we must do. Every Jew realizes, every Orthodox Jew realizes that um, a commandment can be broken if a life depends on it except for fornication, idolatry, and blasphemy, and murder. They, uh, they look at idolatry and blasphemy as being kind of the same. But for those things, those only exceptions, you die before you violate a commandment. But if there's a life on the line, you can violate a commandment. Uh, we're commanded to keep the Sabbath. But if there's someone dying on the side of the road, you break the Sabbath, you do whatever you need to help save that life. In fact, even if it's an animal whose life needs saved, you break the Sabbath for the sake of that animal. And uh, we'll get into this a little bit more later. But in this chapter, it's so unique. He's writing to babies of Messiah. There was a uniquely difficult time at hand. And they needed to learn to adjust to a changing situation. Kind of sounds like today, doesn't it? So let's get right into our chapter. This chapter is in seven sections, and I'm going to clearly label each section. So section one, I call confirmation of Torah-based marriage. Many people read these opening verses, and they think, well, Paul's against marriage. But he's going to pains here to show that he's very orthodox in his views. He says, now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. Or your translation may say, as NASB does, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. But we understand what he means by that. 
But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife, and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights, and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time, that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again, so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. This is very traditional Torah-based teaching on marriage. According to the Torah, and uh, the references in Exodus chapter 21, and verse 10 in particular, there are three things a man must provide for his wife. Food, shelter, I mean, clothing, which includes shelter, roof over her head, and sexual intimacy. If he lacks in providing any one of those three, the Torah gives her permission to leave that husband and find another one. You know, the scriptures say that God hates divorce. He does. But he permits it in order to protect the innocent victim. And if a woman, a wife, is not receiving these three very basic things, then God says, for your sake, you are allowed to leave, and I hate you have to, but I cannot expect you to live with this man if he's not providing these three fundamental things that every husband must provide for his wife. Now, there are other things we could go into, but Paul is reiterating that here. Now, that very first verse most translations translate as I have it on the screen. Now concerning the things about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. It's good not to ever have sex. That's thus the Roman Catholic celibacy in their priesthood. But look at how the ESV translated it, which makes a lot more sense. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, quote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, unquote. In other words, Paul is not saying it's not good for a man and woman to be together. He's quoting what they had said in a letter to him. And he's commenting on that, saying, there might be times in your marriage when it's good to abstain for a while, so you can devote yourselves to prayer and other things, but always come back together. But why would the Corinthians write to Paul about this concern saying it's good for a man and woman not to even have anything to do with each other. Just, just say goodbye to sexuality altogether. Why would they do that? Well, we have to realize that in the ancient pagan world, in Corinth and the other cities that Paul visited, sex basically had no rules. And so it was indulged in every way and every time and to any degree a person wanted. And when people came to the Lord, they were so convicted about their many, many sexual sins. It's like an alcoholic who's recovered saying, we're never going to touch alcohol again. It's the same sort of thing. You know, the Bible uh, condones drinking alcohol, provided you'd never become drunk. And wine is a very important part of wedding ceremonies and and um, the dedication of a baby at the circumcision. You take a drop of wine, put it on the boy's lips. It's a part of the uh, Erev Shabbat service that you have in your home. You bless the cup, you bless the, the bread. And uh, wine plays a very important part in, in, uh, in Torah observance. But when we have someone come into our home that we know who has struggled with alcohol, we don't even offer it because we don't want to put temptation or stumbling block in their way. But getting back to this, it would appear that some of the people in this ancient pagan world were so convicted and so horrified when they realized how awful the things they did were, they just thought, let's just not in even indulge that. Mm -hmm. So Paul's addressing that concern. Just to give you an idea, this photograph is from a street corner in the ancient city of Ephesus, you know, the, the, the city to which Paul wrote the, the letter to the Ephesians. Now, what you see in this picture, this is right on a street corner, the main corner inside the city of Ephesus. You see a left foot, 
And then up here, you see a heart. And then down here, you see a woman. She, she's kind of weird looking. There's this thing sticking out of her head, and she's got these real pointy lips. It looks more like Daffy Duck. Uh, but we, it's obviously a woman. And there's a rectangle here, which we can only assume is a bed. So this is a, an advertisement saying, if you want to, to kiss on Daffy Duck, turn left here. Okay? So, and they, they discovered this, and that's what it means. And there was a brothel in the ruins. They found a brothel down the road to the left. And this was so common. This was so common in the ancient Roman and Greek world. So um, there's a description of this, this uh, carving and the, the flagstones in the notes. So if you download the notes later, you can read more about that. And you know, in the 60s, the U.S. and for that part, all the Western world went through a, a cultural change and the hippie movement and all the drugs and and since birth control was readily available, they called it the, the time of free love. Free love. And I, I looked up the definition of the phrase free love, and this is what the, the dictionary said. The idea or practice of having sexual relations according to choice without being restricted by marriage or long-term relationships. But you know what? This is how the enemy... <laughs> This is how the enemy misuses words. Because free love is not free, neither is it love. If you go back and you talk to the people who indulged in free love in the 60s, and now they pay the consequences in broken relationships, in their health, in the diseases they have, and yes, and, and, and the, um, the illegitimate children that were born out of that or, or aborted, there's so much scarring, there's so much damage, there's so much heavy price put on this idea of free love. And I realized it wasn't love, it was lust. So they shouldn't call it free love, they should call it expensive lust. That is the accurate term for this. Expensive, costly lust. Be careful what things are called. Words mean things. And when we change the definitions of words, then we enter into confusion and we, we stray from truth. So that gives you a little bit of a background as to what Paul's talking about here. But make no mistake that in these first verses, in the first five verses, he is not in any way diminishing marriage. He is simply holding up traditional Torah-based marriage concepts. Now in the part, <clears throat> the next section, section two, there's a caveat. Now what is a caveat? Here's the definition, a warning or proviso, a certain condition of specific stipulations, conditions, or limitations. In other words, here is an exception to the rule. Here's an exception to the rule. And so this section is verses six through nine. And he says, now as a suggestion, not a command, this is a suggestion, this is my caveat, I say this. I wish that all, whereas I myself am, but each has his own charisma. Charisma. Charisma is a word for gift, but it means a grace or a gracious gift. When we get over to the spiritual gifts, this will be the spiritual charismas, charisma. And it means a grace. And we'll, we'll explain this in a moment. But each has his own charisma from God, one of one kind and one of another kind. To the unmarried and the widows, unmarried and widows are single, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. For it is very, better to marry than to burn with passion. So here's his caveat. Now, this does not fly in the face of Torah, but it definitely is contrary to Jewish tradition. In Jewish tradition, a woman should marry shortly after puberty. 
14 was the ideal time in the ancient world. And a man should marry shortly after puberty, around 14, 15, because they believed this was healthy. They believed it actually increased the intelligence of a, of a guy. And, um, and also, he wouldn't be so distracted. But if a man wasn't married by 18, he was considered to be a sinner. If he wasn't married by 20, he's considered to be a heretic. So let's get something very straight right now. Paul had been married. He was now single, but he had definitely been married. And the way we know this is because over in Philippians 3, 5, he talks about himself, his pedigree. He says, you know, he talks about he's a, uh, a well, here's what it says. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. That was a very special thing to be a tribe of uh, the tribe of Benjamin. A Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the Torah, a Pharisee. Let's get it straight. If you're a Hebrew of Hebrews and a Pharisee, you're married by the time you're 18. Paul had been married. No question about that. Okay? Just put that to rest. There's no argument. He had been married. He's now single. Had his wife died? Possibly. Most likely, she had left him. Because here he was, this zealot for um, Jewish tradition, persecuting the redeemed community. And then all of a sudden, overnight, he changes. What wife will put up with that? She probably left him. He was probably a divorcee himself. And he stayed single because he wanted to devote himself to God's work without any undivided loyal, any divided loyalties. So, when does a caveat take place? When commandments collide with each other, and when commandments collide with reality. We've talked before about how many times commandments collide with each other. Example, keep the Sabbath. Don't do any work on the Sabbath. But the priest worked every Sabbath. Why? Because the temple trumps the Sabbath. Don't work on the Sabbath, but you're supposed to feed your animals. Your animals aren't allowed to work on the Sabbath either, but they have to be fed. Feeding the animals is work. So taking care of animals trumps the commandment of the Sabbath. This is why Yeshua talks about the weightier parts of the Torah. Some commandments have more weight than others. Okay? They just do. And if we don't understand the Torah, if we don't understand God's heart, we're going to make mistakes. And we're going to want to crucify the Lord of life because he does what? He heals someone on the Sabbath day. You see, we, we need to make sure we, we weigh the commandments properly. This takes wisdom, takes discernment. And this is when you go to someone who's older, been walking in Torah longer than you, when you, when you find a con conflict between commandments. It happens all the time. You have to decide which one takes precedent over the other. And when commandments collide with reality, let's say you're in a position where you are starving to death. You are starving. And yet there's a piece of unclean food there, something the Torah forbids. Which commandment do you keep? The commandment to choose life or the commandment not to eat something that's, that the Bible forbids? Which is the way to your commandment? The commandment to choose life is always the way to your and God himself tells us that his commandments were meant for life, not for death. Okay, you, you understand? So sometimes commandments just collide with reality. What happens you can't keep a Sabbath? What happens when you can't eat kosher? What happens when something happens and you just can't do things the way they were? The very first commandment in the Bible is be fruitful and multiply. It's only going to happen if a man's touching a woman, okay? It's only going to happen when that, that, that occurs. But he's saying during this time, even though God says it's not good for man to be alone, Paul's saying during this time, it's probably better for a man to stay single. Now, if you can't stay single, get married. But there's a caveat. There's a particular time here where you take a pause from fulfilling that commandment. And let's focus on what we need to do. Mm. 
Section three, the unequally yoked. You know, Paul takes these rabbi trails. He's talking about marriage. He's talking about being single. So now he's going to address uh, something else, whether they asked about this in their letter to Paul or not. He addresses it. What happens if you're married, you become a believer, and then your, your husband or your wife chooses not to become a believer? What do you do? Verse 10. To the married, I give this charge, not I, but the master. This is what the master is saying. This is coming from God. The wife should not separate from her husband. But if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And the husband should not leave his wife. Now, what conditions are we talking about separation or leaving? He goes on to verse 12. To the rest I say, I, not the Lord, this is, my, this is my advice, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever, okay, he's a believer, she isn't, but she consents to live with him, he should not leave her. If any woman, she's a believer, has a husband who is an unbeliever, but he consents to live with her, she should not leave him. Now think about this. In ancient Corinth, these pagan individuals are now hearing the good news of the truth of Yeshua. Their lives are changing, transforming. They don't worship the old gods. They don't go to the temple anymore. They now worship the one true God, the invisible God. They recognize Messiah as his son and their, their savior. Their lives are completely changed. This can put a lot of tension in a marriage, right? Uh, we've seen tension when one, when there are two believers married, one of them becomes messianic, begins to embrace the Torah. That puts tension. I see Wendell grinning over here. That can put tension in a, in a marriage. Not as much as what Paul's talking about, but uh, you have to use great wisdom and gentleness. I, sometimes a guy will begin to embrace Torah and he's just ready to preach to his wife how she needs to change. It's like, Cool your jets, calm down, be gentle, woo her into this, don't preach at her, and, uh, and vice versa. So he's talking about this situation. And then look what he says in verse 14. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife. In other words, since she has set apart to the Lord and he's content to live with her, he too is set apart to the Lord, even though he may not be a believer yet, even though he may not embrace her new faith, her being set apart to the Lord, his desire to stay attached to her affects his relationship with the Lord as well in ways he doesn't even realize. So let me read it again. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let him separate. In, each, in such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. You don't have to stay marry that person. If they want to go, they can go. God has called you to peace. In other words, don't insist on living under the same roof as someone who doesn't want to live there with you. Let them go. Let there be peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? Now, that word save is, uh, we think of save, we think of salvation, you know, from sin and whatever. Uh, but this word means to preserve and to maintain as well. Now, what's interesting in this entire passage, the word divorce is not used a single time. The words leave, which is chorizo, and separate, afiemi, are used six times in this section. But the words for divorce, there's two of them, apoluo and apostosin, are not used at all. Now, how do we know these words mean divorce? Because in the Gospels, whenever the, someone would ask Yeshua about divorce, in, in the Torah, it talks about divorce, giving a certificate of divorce and how God hates divorce. These are the words that are used. These two here. Those are not the words used in this passage. 
It's separating or leaving. It could be a couple things. I don't know. So this is Grant, not the Lord saying this, all right? It could be that in ancient Corinth, I mean, what was the wedding ceremony even like? Was it sacred? Was it something even recognized by God? Was a divorce even necessary? The man says, I'm out of here, I'm done. And maybe that was it. Legally, there was nothing more to do. He just left, or the woman would leave. So it could be marriage, since marriage didn't really mean much of anything in ancient Corinth, divorce didn't either. On the other hand, it could mean that, okay, they're separating, they're leaving, but the believing partner who's staying faithful to the Lord is still holding out hope that the unbelieving partner will turn their hearts. God will apprehend their hearts and bring them back. So why cut it off completely? And uh, so there's a, a lot of dynamics going on here, but these are applying to the situation there. So let's be careful how we apply them to modern situations, right? So does that, does that make sense to those of you? See, I wish I could ask people who are uh, online right now, but uh, is that making sense, some clarity? Great question. Robin's asking, is it legitimate to apply these principles to our modern situation? Again, we have to be careful. We have to read the situation and the times and so on. But going back to what Paul says earlier, he is reinforcing traditional Torah marriage. And the Torah provides and allows divorce, legal separation, divorce, it's ended, it's done. That is, if the man does not provide food, doesn't take care of his wife. Clothing, which would include shelter. It doesn't provide sexual relations. And then the Bible clearly permits the woman to divorce. She doesn't have to, but if she does, uh, there, there's no repercussions. There's no, no condemnation whatsoever. You can expand that out as well. Well, what if he's beating her? Okay, he clothes her, he feeds her, and he's having relations with her, but he's beating her. Well, then I think the the rules and the laws concerning the freedom of a slave kick in because the Torah provides that if you knock your slave's tooth out or you break his bone or even bruise him, he is free. He becomes a free man, a free woman. I think that applies to marriage as well. That's my opinion, not the Lord's. Okay. All right. Are we ready to move on? Good question. Thank you. Now we come to Section number four. Oh, by the way, yeah, I have to share this. When he talks about the unbelieving husband being sanctified, made holy by the believing wife, I think the principle here is found in Mark 9, verses 40 and 41, where Yeshua says, For the one who is not against us is for us. Let that sink in. Think how gracious God is. We want people to accept him as their Savior, make him their Lord. And Yeshua says, yeah, I want that too. But you know what? If they're not against me, they're not against you, I treat it as if they're for us. What a gracious God we have. He says, for truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Messiah will by no means lose his reward. There's reward in just, even if you're a, a sinner, a pagan, an atheist, If you do something to assist someone you know who is a believer and you can love them and be gracious to them even though they're a believer, God says you're going to get a reward for that. That's how gracious God is. We are prone to catch our kids being bad. God is prone to catch his kids being good. And he doesn't let any slightest work in his name uh, fall to the ground. Another passage that you should check out is a little longer, but it, it, it contains a little more information, is Matthew 10, verses 40 to 42. Great passage, wonderful passage. Talks about the same sort of theme. Okay. Now, section four. Living one's assigned life. I tell you what, this is good advice for everybody 
whether it's troubled times or not. Well, we come to verse 17. It says, Only let each person lead the life that the Master has assigned to him and to which God has called him. The Master is assigned and God is called. Now, I was reading this this week and I started thinking, am I living my assigned life? You know, there were times in my youth I would aspire to live overseas or go into some career that would do this. And, you know, I still live just within probably a five minute drive of where I grew up, maybe 10 minutes. And uh, I've just stayed in my old stomping grounds. And it wasn't the way I intended it to be, just the way it is. And um, I guess this is the place God assigned me to be, so this is where I am. I'm content. This is my rule in all the assembly. So Paul, again, is talking from his own experience, his own wisdom. Was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at the time of his call circumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. Now, let's understand what he means. When Paul uses the term circumcision, it means conversion to Judaism. It's code words. It's not just a a minor surgery a guy goes through. It means conversion. The circumcision, those are the Jewish people, the Jewish men. And to become circumcised means to convert to Judaism. And as you read through Galatians, we realize that there were Jewish believers coming through Galatia and telling the Gentile believers, well, unless you're circumcised, you're not saved. You're not a member of the covenant. In other words, unless you convert to Judaism, you're not really in with God. And Paul just ripped that to shreds. That made him so angry because what they were teaching was a violation of the Torah. Nowhere in the Torah is circumcision a way to get right with God circumcision was given to Abraham as a sign that he was right with God. All right? But there's a whole lot more we could talk about when it comes to circumcision, what it represents, and so on. And I've done teachings on that that you can look at. So, he's talking about conversion. But before you think, okay, I don't have to convert to Judaism, that means I don't have to keep the Torah. Look at verse 19. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but what? Keeping the commandments of God. Whoa. He's talking to Gentiles, telling them, don't bother converting to Judaism, because what really matters is keeping God's commandments. That would be the Torah. It's funny, I, I read... You know, <laughs> when I pick up a Christian commentary by Fulman of Corinthians, this is the first verse I go to look at. I said, what do they say about this? Boy, they do all kinds of dancing and jo- dodging and hopping around to get past that verse as quick as they can because it doesn't agree with what they believe. I choose to believe what agrees with Scripture. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. And then he goes on, what if you're born a slave? What if that's the condition you're born into? Were you a bondservant when called? Don't be concerned about it. I like that. Here's my question to you. What condition do you find your life in? Paul's advice is, don't worry about it. Maybe that's where God assigned you. That's where he chose and when he chose and uh, he, he, for you to be born. So grow where you're planted. Learn to be content where you're at. Blossom where you're planted. Be ready to move should God direct you to go to a foreign mission field or whatever. But first of all, be content where you are because if you're not content where you are, you're never going to be content anywhere else. I'm listening to a, a book on tape by one of my favorite authors, George MacDonald. And um, in this book, there's a very wise character, very wise character, an old character. In fact, it turns out he's actually Adam in disguise. And he's learned all these things from his mistakes and so on. He's so full of wisdom. And he's talking to this character. And I'll get the quote wrong. 
but this character is just wanting to move up to something else and do, do something different. And he's told, a man who does not act where he is must travel far to find his work. I love that phrase. The man who does not act where he is, where God has put him right now, he can go to the ends of the earth to find his work. It's going to be a very futile search. That's good advice. So, were you a bondservant when called? Don't be concerned about it. But if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself the opportunity because that will give you more opportunities to, to work. But don't be fretting about it. For he who was called in the master as a bondservant is a freedman of the Lord. Let me tell you, if you're a slave, how you can be free right now. If you're a slave, that means you can only do what your master, your owner, dictates for you to do. And it's miserable. But when you meet God, and he says, I want you to love your enemy. I want you to love your neighbor. I want you to love your master. Because you do that, you're pleasing me. Now, I'm serving this owner of mine because I choose to, because I love him. Because I know this is where God wants me to be. I'm now exercising free will to do the exact same things I did yesterday and the day before. And it may look to everyone out there like I'm still just a slave owned by this guy. When actually, I'm doing this because I choose to do it. And because I know it pleases God. I'm free. When your motive changes to the mindset of genuine spiritual freedom, you are the master's freed man. And you're not doing anything because you have to. You're doing something because you know God's ordained it for you and you choose to do it. Next time, moms, you have to change the diaper. Realize I don't have to change this diaper. I'm doing it because I love my baby. I want the house to smell better. <laughs> <You know? laughs> All kinds of reasons to make that choice. But if you look at, oh, I got to do this again, then you're a slave. You're miserable. But um, do it as a freed man, a freed woman. Yeah, go ahead, Robin. Paul was tested on this literally because so much of what he gave us was written while he was in jail. Absolutely. And he could have shut down and thought, well, now it's yeah. all over. Yeah. 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 That's right. Great, great insight. Robin just said that Paul himself was tested on this because several of his letters were written while he was in jail, in prison. And he might say, oh, this is, I'm so miserable here. I tried to serve the Lord. Look where this sends me up. But if he hadn't been in prison, we wouldn't have had the letter to the Ephesians, which is absolutely, you know, I always call it the Alps of the New Testament. It's just heady stuff he wrote. But if he had gone to Ephesus as a free man, he wouldn't have had to write the letter. We wouldn't have it in our Bibles. You understand? So, your attitude is your own. Use it wisely. It goes on. Likewise, he who was free when called, don't forget, you're a bondservant of Messiah. I put down the question, are you a bondservant of Messiah? Have you chosen in your mind to sacrifice your freedom, your right to yourself, to his lordship? I want you to look at a couple passages here. John 5.30 and John 6.38. Look what Yeshua says. I do not seek my own will. Let that sink in. I do not seek my own will. In other words, he's saying, I don't do what I want to do. And you'd think that if there's anyone in history we could trust to always have his will exactly spot on to be Messiah, the sinless son of God. But here he is, he says, I don't do what I want to do. I don't do my will, I, but the will of him who sent me. John 6, 38, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will. 
In fact, later in John 8, he says, I didn't even come here under my own will. I was sent by the Father. He didn't come here because he wanted to. And when he was here, he didn't do what he wanted to. He was tempted in every way we are. There was a part of him who wanted to just sleep in, not get up early and pray. Who wanted not to go to the cross. But he said, nevertheless, Father, not my will, but yours be done. Now, I bring these up because we call ourselves disciples of Messiah. This is how Messiah lived. A disciple lives his life like the Messiah does, the best he can. So if the Messiah came, not doing his own will, but the will of the Father who sent him, how should we live? By not doing our own will. But always consulting the word. Lord, what do you want? I'm your bondservant. I don't decide when I take a day off. I'm yours. That's how a disciple lives. Get used to it. But I tell you what, since God's will is so much more perfect than yours, he knows what's better for you than you do. Right? He's a father who loves his children. And the whole time he is your master and you're his bondservant, he's also your father. You're his kids. He wants you to be happy. He wants you to be fulfilled. He wants to be fruitful. He wants to embrace you in a day to come. Say, well done. So everything he wants for you and everything he wants to do through you is awesome. And if your will contradicts his, I don't care how good your will is, how wonderful your intentions, they're going to be subpar. Let's do things his way. Because there's no better way. So, if you're a slave, don't seek to be freed from that. But realize you're a freed man. If you're a freed man, remember, you're actually a bondservant of Messiah. Isn't that amazing? That's a very Jewish way to put things, the way Paul does here. And he reminds them, 23, you were bought with a price, just like a slave. You were bought and paid for. And this is a, he's actually quoting what he said back in chapter 6, verse 20. For you are bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Do not become bondservants of men. So, brothers, in whatever condition each was called, there let him remain with God. Good advice all the way around. Section 5. Advice for unstable times. This is the, the core of this chapter. This is the, the heartbeat and, and the... Uh, the motive for why this chapter is written, especially the way it was. Verse 25, Now concerning the betrothed, those who are engaged, I have no command from the master, but I give my opinion as one who by the master's mercy is trustworthy. Okay, this is my opinion. But he's saying, but folks, I've walked with the Lord a lot longer than you have. He sent me to talk to you. I'm going to give you my best wisdom on this. If you're engaged, I think that in view, I think that in view of the present distress, the present trial is a way to put it, it is good for a person to remain as he is. In other words, hold off the wedding. Are you bound to a wife? Okay, if you're married, don't seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? You're separated? Don't seek a wife. But if you do marry, you've not sinned, don't worry. And if a betrothed woman marries, she has not sinned. Yet those who marry, now your translation probably says, have worldly troubles. I know one marriage counselor, we have a video of him. He talks about how couples come and say, we got trouble in our marriage. And he holds up this verse. He says, well, that looks about right. Yeah, because Paul says, you, you marry, you're going to have trouble. But it's not worldly troubles. It actually says fleshly distress, physical distress. A very different twist on things, but that's exactly what the Greek says. And I would spare you that. Now, is Paul against marriage? Not at all. Does he think marriage is a good thing? Absolutely. God invented it. It's the first commandment. Be fruitful, multiply. 
But he says, in light of the present trial, the present distress, this is some advice I'm giving you. And it's not sin if you don't follow it. I'm just giving you some counsel here. Think about it. Do what's wise. And then verse 29, he says, excuse me, this is what I mean, brothers. The appointed season has grown very short. We have a very small window to continue things as they are. From now on, and then he says five very strange things. First, let those who have wives live as though they had none. Second, those who mourn as if they were not mourning. Third, those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing. Fourth, those who buy as though they had no goods. And fifth, those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this cosmos, this world system, He's not talking about the earth. That's a different word. The cosmos is like the world system. For this present world system is passing away. Why do these five things? What is this, what's this speaking to here? Let those who have wives as though live as though they had none. He's saying husbands, wives, have good strong marriages. But you have to really start focusing outward and look at the needs for others. Look after the needs of others. Your community needs you. Are you mourning? I get it. But this is not a time to indulge your own emotion, no matter how horrible and painful and sad it is. We don't have that luxury. You're needed on the front lines. You're rejoicing? Great, good for you. But pay attention. You don't have the luxury of just giving into your emotions and being carried by your emotions. You own a bunch of stuff, great, but that's not important. You may be losing all of that. Act as if you had nothing. Focus on what is at hand. I mean, it's like you're in the house and you're playing with the kids and your your spouse runs in. Honey, hurry up. The house is burning down. There's also an earthquake. Both. Okay, honey, let us finish our game of Uno here first. You get it? You say you don't have time to do that. The house is burning out, down. The house is shaking. You'll have time to rejoice later for things and to mourn for things and to do things. But right now, there's something so important, so imperative. can't be business as usual anymore. For this time, this season, he says, this season. And then number five, those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. You're in business? Great. But all that may go away. Get used to not being in business because you need to focus on what God wants. Now you'll see I have dot, dot, dot after this because it continues in the next section. Maybe these should all be one section. But the tone seems to change a bit. So, advice for unstable times, give undivided devotion to God. Verse 32. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of Adonai, or the master, how to please the master, how to please Yeshua. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife. And it's just a statement of fact. Not a bad thing, it's just the way it is. When I was single, I didn't really care about what Robin wanted, unless I was with Robin on a date. Now that I'm married, I'm concerned with what Robin wants. (laughs) You didn't hear that comment right there. (laughs) <laughs> and his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the, of the master, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. It's just some statement of fact, no condemnation. It's just the way it is. I say this for your benefit, not to lay any restraints upon you. I'm not trying to squash you, but to promote good order and secure your undivided devotion to the master. Again, this chapter is for a very troubled time, a unique temporary situation. And you know, you've heard me ramble on over the last few weeks about the dark days coming on our country. Those dark days aren't forever, though. They aren't forever. They're always temporary. But for whatever it takes for us, we need to give God our undivided attention. We have to change how we do things. 
wonder why we're promoting home groups. This is part of it. God was so gracious to give us this vision and this clear direction a few months ago. We're going to continue to build on this and help you as you start your home fellowships. And you're going to be so glad we did because there are dark times coming. There's persecution coming. The world has changed. And God has graciously given us some insight. And I don't think it's any coincidence that we're looking at this particular chapter out of all the chapters in the Bible at this time in our history. I think the tone here, I think what Paul might have in mind are rules of warfare. In Deuteronomy 20, verses 7 and 8, through Moses, God gives this instruction. You guys are all going to war, all right? You're all lined up there, get ready to go into battle. Then the high priest comes along and he invites people to leave the front lines. Are you afraid? Then leave. No condemnation, just leave, or else your fear might affect your, uh, your brothers here going to battle. And he gives some instructions, but then verses 7 and 8, And who is the man that is engaged to a woman and has not married her? Let him depart and return to his house. You can't be distracted. If you're going into battle, you may not come home. You can't go into battle if you're distracted by what if I die? You know, and he goes on, lest he die in the battle, another man marry her. That would be torture. To go into battle, is like, I might die here, and this wonderful woman I'm in love with, we're getting married here in a month, I may not get to marry her. What's worse, some other guy will. God says, don't fight, go, go home, go home. Then the officer shall speak further to the people and they shall say, who is the man that is afraid and faint-hearted? Let him depart, return to his house so that he might not make his brother's hearts melt like his heart. And that's kind of what Paul's saying here. You have to be realize it's not going to be business as usual. So if you're single, stay single, you need to focus. But he says, this is my advice. God's not commanding this. Because what I'm telling you is a caveat. It's not completely in line with God's commandments. It's a temporary hold. So just realize this is a unique time. And then we come to section 7. But always do what is proper. We can use caveats for all kinds of excuses. He's saying, no, no, do what is proper. Verse 36, if anyone thinks that he is not behaving properly toward his betrothed, if his passions are strong, and it has to be, let him do as he wishes. Let him marry. It is no sin. But whoever is firmly established in his heart, being under no necessity but having his desire under control, has determined this in his heart to keep her as his betrothed, he will do well. So then he who marries his betrothed does well, and he who refrains from marriage will do even better. A wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is free to be married to whom she wishes, only in the master, has to be a believer. Yet, in my opinion, she is happier she remains as she is. And I think that I, too, have the Spirit of God. I think God agrees with me, he's saying. I was thinking about chess. I'll finish with this. You know, chess, it's got to be the best game in the world. And uh, those of you who play, you know, you have very basic rules. If you ever taught a child to play, you teach them very basic moves for each piece. And let's take an example, the pawn. You got eight of them, you know, and they're the least important piece, but they're still important. The pawn moves forward one square at a time. Can't go sideways, can't go diagonal, can't go backward, just forward one square at a time. Right? Simple. But there's a caveat. The first time a pawn moves, you can't move him two squares, but only that first move. And if a pawn comes face to face with an opponent in the next square, he can't capture him. He can only capture a opponent who's diagonal to him. Another caveat. A little break in the general rule if you only move forward. And of course, the biggest caveat in chess is castling. You all know what castling is? Very weird. The king can move one square at a time, any direction, but only one square. That's it. Boom. Any direction, forward, backward, diagonal, one square. But as long as the king is still in his spot in the back row, he hasn't moved, and the castles, which are in the corners, and they haven't moved yet, and there's nothing in between a king and either of the castles, the king does the weirdest thing if you want him to. 
he moves two squares sideways. Boom, boom. That's a complete break with the rules of how a king moves. But not only that, but the castle then slides all the way over and jumps over the king and takes its position on the opposite side of the king. The king moves in a way it never moves. And then you move a second piece in the same turn. That never happens. But it's still part of the rules. It's not a break with the rules, but it's a very odd, unusual rule that can be used once in your game of chess. God gives us rules to live by, but then he brings us unusual times. And um, he says these unusual times, so some higher rules come into play. Because what does God tell us to do? Go out into the world, make disciples of all nations, right? But in unusual times of persecution, what does he say? Come, my people, enter your rooms and close the door behind you. Hide for a little while. The indignation runs its course. For behold, Adonai is about to come out from his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. And there's a lot of iniquity. We're talking about people staying in the, in the state that they were born into. Slave or free, circumcised or uncircumcised. We have people born now as a boy and thinking, you know, I think I'll become a girl. There's so much iniquity. And the earth will reveal her bloodshed. In the U.S. alone, over 60 million babies have been aborted since abortion was legalized 50 years ago last April. Jonathan Kahn suggests that this coronavirus, which basically is not affecting infants and little children, only affecting old people. Older people who would have been at the age for passing abortion laws 50 years ago, they're the ones being hammered by it. I do believe we're living in a time where God is revealing the bloodshed of the earth and the slain are no longer covered. He's going to bring to mind all the death, all the bloodshed. We think Baal worship and Molech worship were awful because people would offer their children. Yeah. At least there they thought they were worshiping a God yeah. who they thought would bring rain in the spring and fertility to their animals and to themselves. Yeah, I'll, I'll throw this child in the fire before, the, before Molech because then I know he'll bring me more children. So the benefits outweigh the cost. And how many have aborted a child thinking the benefits outweigh the cost? 60 million. I don't know how many babies were sacrificed to Moloch and to Baal in ancient times. But in this country alone, 60 million? That doesn't count all the other countries. Yeah, the God himself. And, um, you know, God's patient. But there comes a time when the consequences have to be paid. And so, so much of what's happening in the world today and in our country, I think, is God saying, okay, enough's enough. You've broken your covenant with me. You've asked me to leave. I'm leaving. But in my place is coming some wrath. Well, here's some good news. When I read this passage in Isaiah 26, which we looked at last week, I can't help but think about this week's Torah portion, which is what? About the plagues in Egypt. Did the Israelites suffer during the plagues? Just the first three. The ones are kind of annoying down here. You know, the river turned to blood. That had to smell horrible. Then all the frogs, that had to be a, a real trip. And then... Um, uh, the third one was the, the lice. No, not the lice. The third was what? Um, oh, I should know this. Anyways, but after the first three, the ones that the magicians could imitate, after that, God says, I'm putting a barrier between the, the, the Egyptians and the Israelites. They're going to be protected from all the rest. I bet they spent a lot of time in their rooms with their doors closed. And they're protected. They were safe. And especially on that last plague, they were commanded to go into their rooms, close the doors, put the blood on there. I'll pass over you. You're going to be fine. And we're in that kind of a time now. So uh, maybe it's just coincidence this week is the 
the study of the plagues, but that was a unique time for Israel. This is a unique time for believers around the world and for us here in the U.S. So with that, I've gone over. We're going to go ahead and close in prayer. Our Father and King, thank you for these timely words. Thank you for Paul and his faithfulness. He suffered so much in his life. But I know now he has not one single regret for any of it. So Lord, if we are called to go through suffering because of our love for you and our devotion to you, may we do so with great anticipation of seeing your face soon. Lord, help us to be lights in a darkening world. And Lord, help us to be faithful as we go into our homes with friends and with family and pray together and search your word together and have times of joy and oneg together. And as long as we can do that, may we take advantage of that and benefit from it. So bless people who hear this teaching and those who are now returning to their homes as, as they did in Acts, as they did in Corinth, meeting in homes and where your kahal thrived and grew and flourished. Lord, do that once again, that even as the world is suffering and crumbling, your people will thrive and flourish and be fruitful. Lord, it's exciting to be alive in these days. And we choose courage and joy. And we say no to the temptation of fear. Because we know who we belong to. We know who our Savior is and our protector. And it's in Him we trust. It's in His name we pray. Amen.